Hello and welcome back for part three of four of our look at the digestive system. We have uh, made our way into the intestines. Um, we left off with our look at talking about uh, the, uh, the liver and uh, the gallbladder and the pancreas. Um, and how they kind of work in conjunction to uh, begin to function within the first part of the small intestines, and that being the duodenum. Um, remember, kind of going back to the uh, going back to um, the pancreas, just real quick. The pancreas does com is composed of, remember, two really different types of tissues. Uh, you have the exocrine function and you have the endocrine function. Uh, when we're talking about digestion, we are referring to or talking about the uh, exocrine function. We are not talking about, we are not talking about um, the endocrine function here. We are talking strictly about we are talking strictly about the exocrine function. So it's the um, it's those sinner cells uh, and the um, pancreatic acini um, uh, that are creating and releasing the pancreatic juice and the enzymes that are associated uh, with digestion. Um, we are not referring to the islets of Langerhans or the pancreatic islets. Remember, they uh, are involved in um, uh, endocrine function. So that is what is ref that is what is releasing uh, insulin. That is what is releasing glucagon. Um, that is what is releasing somatostatin uh, with your alpha cells, your beta cells, and your delta cells. So uh, I just wanted to touch on that. I did not touch on that in the last video, and I wanted to make sure that that was clear, that we are referring to the exocrine function. And so um, our small intestines are composed of uh, three specific regions. Right. The first of those regions right here is the duodenum. Uh, it is the smallest of the regions. It is the smallest of the regions. The duodenum is only about six inches long. So it is not that large. Uh, the primary function of the duodenum is to neutralize the chyme that is coming out of the stomach. So um, if I did not mention this before, I will mention this now. The substance that is coming into the stomach is what we call the bolus. Well, after all of this chemical digestion that is happening here within the stomach, we are then creating what we define as being chyme. And so this is further um, digested material uh, that is now exiting the stomach and so this is partially digested uh, food in conjunction with all of the gastric juice that is now being secreted through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestines uh, specifically the duodenum and so uh, here is again the duodenum again it's only about six inches long all right there is this very sharp, uh, almost 90 degree bend right here. Right? This is what we define as being the duodenal jejunal flexure. Uh, and that is important because this is the point where the small intestines goes from being the duodenum to being the jejunum. Right? And the jejunum accounts for about 40%, 39% of the entire length of uh, the small intestines. And so uh, remember that the small intestines um, in the living individual is about 16 feet long. Um, uh, Post-mortem, uh, that goes up to about 18, maybe 19 feet long. Um, but in living 
individuals, uh, it's about 16 feet of intestinal tract. So 40% of that uh, is uh, tied up within the jejunum. Right. And then uh, the remaining 60% is ileum. Right. And so here is the end of the ileum. Uh, you can't really tell uh, where on this image you transition from uh, going from the jejunum to the ileum. Right? But you definitely know this area down here is the ileum. And so uh, where the ileum ties into or joins with, this here is the cecum. So this here would be the start of the colon or the large intestine. Uh, where we start with that, And where these two structures merge in, that is where we have the ileocecal valve. And that is what is remaining, or that is what is regulating uh, whatever has not been absorbed within the small intestines and entering into the colon. Okay. Um, absorption of nutrients and water will take place all along this pathway. Okay. All along this pathway. Uh, water is being absorbed, um, nutrients are being absorbed, and we will look at that here coming up in a few minutes. All right, just real quick, uh, remember that with the duodenum, uh, accounts for about 1% of the total length of the small intestines. Uh, in other words, um, about 6 inches, uh, approximately. Uh, the jejunum is equaling about 39 percent of the total length. So remember that the total length the total length is approximately 16 feet. All right. And that is living tissue. And it goes to about 19 feet or so uh, post-mortem. Right. And so if we look at that, um, if we look at that, uh, you're dealing with right around seven feet or so. Right, so you're dealing with seven or eight feet of jejunum. And then the ileum is 60%. Uh, and so you're dealing with um, about 10 feet of uh, small intestine. All right, and so uh, that's about the breakdown of what we see within, uh, structurally anyway, within the small intestines. This slide here is an overview of um, what is happening with histology. Let me kind of come back in here. And so key things to pay attention here, we have our circular folds, which we uh, identified in the lab. Right. And so those circular folds um, are found straight through the small intestines, whether it's the duodenum, the jejunum, or the ileum. Uh, and it's part of the responsibility of these circular folds to help increase the surface area within the small intestines to aid in absorption. Uh, and in fact, uh, sitting on the circular folds, we know we have the villi, and sitting on the villi, we know that we have um, microvilli. Um, it's the job of the microvilli, once again, to really even more increase the surface area within uh, the lumen of the small intestines. Uh, the villi has absorptive cells on them, as well as goblet cells. And so the job of the goblet cells is to secrete mucus. 
That again helps with keeping things moving through the small intestines. And um, the absorptive cells again are there. That's what's going to contain the microvilli uh, to help go ahead and absorb the nutrients right, that are passing through. Um, and again, you can see here there are, uh, I've outlined all the subdivisions for you. Um, there's a slide in the student PowerPoint um, that you can actually go in and click and learn and kind of review more of these um, layers right, um, for the for the exam. Right. And over here, once again, we just have a breakdown of those cells that we are seeing. So the microvilli, uh, which are sitting on top of those absorptive cells um, to aid in the absorption of nutrients. All right, we see that we've got those goblet cells that are also located there. Again, goblet cells are going to be um, uh, involved in uh, the secretion of mucus. All right. uh, those um, enteroendocrine cells, uh, which uh, cholecytokines, um, help in stimulation of absorption of and regulating of digestion. Right? And then uh, the panth cells, which we will get to here uh, in a few minutes, um, those panth cells uh, help in the secretion of lysozymes um, to aid in destroying any kind of bacteria that may still be lingering uh, in the digested food that is now being absorbed. All right, and so there are your main cell types. I also want to draw your attention to the green that is coming up through here. All right, so coming up into um, the villi, all right, or I should say into the uh, into the circular fold right here. That green is a lacteal duct. Uh, the lacteal ducts are an extension of uh, the lymphatic system and it aids in the absorption of uh, fat uh, that is too large to pass through and into the capillaries and so when we have uh, globulars of fat that are too large to be absorbed uh, we go ahead and we pass them into the lymphatic system and those lacteals uh, handle that and so that that works very well all right um, and the other thing I will draw your attention to are the intestinal crypts um, those intestinal crypts that you are seeing right down in uh, this area right in here right? that would be your intestinal crypt area all right uh, those intestinal crypts actually are lined with cells that are going to be uh, secreting enzymes such as sucrase and maltase um, to go ahead and uh, stimulate the breakdown of carbohydrates, of sugars. Um, so sucrase, sucrase is an enzyme that's going to be breaking down sucrose, maltase is an enzyme that's going to be breaking down maltose, and uh, enteropeptidase. Uh, is another one of those enzymes, I'll write these guys down, uh, that are going to be involved in the secretion, or I should say the activation of pancreatic enzymes that are secreted, or secreted within the duodenum. So let me hop over here real quick. All right, so once again, Sucrase breaks down sucrose, maltase breaks down maltose. Eteropeptidase All 
Enteropeptidase uh, is an enzyme that is going to activate pancreatic enzymes. All right. Just as a just as a reminder um, for uh, for where we are really dealing with all right, within that area, and again, um, that's these areas right down in here. Right, where those intestinal crypts are going to be located. Um, and again, the panith cells, which again you see also down at the bottom of these intestinal crypts, um, they're going to be in the uh, uh, involved in um, microbial defense. So lysozymes are secreted within that area to go ahead and try to stop uh, bacteria from growing. Uh, and taking root. Why is that a concern? Because you're dealing with a lot of mucus uh, and you're dealing with a neutral or even slightly alkaline environment. And so that's a breeding ground for bacteria. Uh, we don't worry about that as much in the stomach because of the acidity of the stomach. And so it's kind of self-regulated, uh, if you would. Um, so in, uh, again, some more, just some more things about absorption. Uh, real quick, uh, carbohydrates, uh, what's going to be driving the absorption of and continued breakdown of carbohydrates is pancreatic amylase. Um, and the, the pancreatic amylase is going to be working in conjunction with um, SGLT proteins, um, sodium glucose transport proteins. Sodium... sodium glucose transport proteins. Um, and so we're basically pumping uh, glucose in, pumping sodium out. Um, and so we're regulating that movement using this protein here. Um, And so you can see there, we're using solvent drag, but yet we've got to make sure that we're balancing out uh, uh, the electrical gradient. So sodium basically moves out as the uh, glucose is moving inward. Um, proteins uh, in the duodenum and uh, mainly within the duodenum, uh, proteins are going to be digested and uh, start to be absorbed under the direction of protease. Uh, pepsin becomes inactivated in the duodenum because the pH raises. And so uh, pepsin uh, typically activates between a pH of about 1.5 to a 3.5. On average, the pH within the stomach is about a 3. And so uh, once you enter, once uh, pepsin goes into the duodenum and we're adding in the chyme with the pancreatic juice, uh, that pH raises because of the bicarbonate and the bile, which is uh, neutralizing all of that stomach acid, pepsin becomes inactive. And so uh, trypsin picks up uh, for where uh, uh, pepsin ends. Um, trypsin is another pancreatic enzyme. Uh, it works in conjunction with proteins to go ahead and absorb and break down uh, the proteins within the small intestines. And then lipids are going to be absorbed, again, using pancreatic lipase. Um, pancreatic lipase is no different than lingual lipase and gastric lipase um, in that it uh, is working through emulsification of fats. And so the way that this works is, let's say you've got yourself a fat globule. All right, right there. And... What will happen is uh, 
pancreatic lipase right, has a, so if you look at pancreatic lipase, right, let's say this is pancreatic lipase, this end is hydrophobic, and this end is hydrophilic. And so remember, we define that then as being a amphiphilic molecule, meaning it is both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. And what will happen is the hydrophobic ends of pancreatic lipase attaches to the globule of fat, and it does that all around. like so, and so that way the hydrophilic ends are facing out. This allows um, for the movement of these larger fat globules uh, to pass through and into either the capillary beds or the lacteals. Um, and this structure, this structure is what we define as being a missile, right? M-I-C-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Right? So this is a missile. Um, it is a combination of the bile salts uh, from bile, uh, and it works with things like pancreatic lipase to go ahead and drive the emulsification of uh, these fat globules into smaller droplets um, that can then be transported across into the capillary beds or into the lacteals uh, if, if necessary. And of course, vitamins are going to be uh, either fat soluble or water soluble. So uh, your fat soluble vitamins as these globules of fat get dragged across um, the small intestines, uh, these fat soluble vitamins are going to be stored within those fat globules and uh, transported across that way. Um, and your water soluble vitamins are just going to be using solvent drag uh, where the water is going to be moving and reabsorbed into um, uh, the capillaries that are coming up into those circular folds. Uh, and those vitamins are going to be dragged right on across using diffusion. Um, I will mention that fat-soluble vitamins need some levels of fat in the diet to be absorbed. And so if you're taking vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, K, um, they're your common fat-soluble vitamins, and your diet is very, very low in fat, chances are you're not really absorbing those vitamins. In other words, you're wasting the vitamins, because you're literally just going to excrete them uh, right on out, and uh, you're wasting that money. You can probably think of a few other ways of saying that, um, but you're, you're excreting it through the urinary system at that point in time, um, and or right through the digestive system. So um, fat-soluble vitamins need fat in your diet to absorb them. Without that, you're wasting your money, and your time. Uh, no benefit whatsoever. What follows next are a series of tables that just kind of outlines for you and highlights right, some of the functions of each of the structures that we have looked at, um, the cell types that you see, uh, what they secrete. So these are just some summary tables that I have included in the um, student slides that I've posted for you to have access for. Um, and this covers all of the enzymes from the oral cavity, the stomach, and the small intestine. So this is a nice little uh, summary table for you. All of this is fair game uh, for 
the exam. So be sure to uh, review these tables uh, and make sure that you are familiar with the information that are on these tables for your lecture exam. Um, last thing I want to touch on, um, just as a little extra, is uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, we know that Crohn's disease is uh, a disease where the small intestines becomes inflamed uh, and easily um, irritable. It is an autoimmune disease. Um, we don't fully understand it, but we know that there is significant inflammation within the intestines, which uh, blocks the absorption of uh, nutrients, um, therefore creates very watery and loose stool. Uh, it is very painful because of the irritation within the lining of the intestines. And uh, it is characterized by these rooster chromes that you see that uh, begin to stick out. Okay, good. Uh, that begin to stick out from the small intestines. So uh, here, Right here is the small intestine. All right, over here is the small intestines. And what you are seeing, and by the way, up here is some more small intestines. There goes some more small intestines for you. Uh, and what you are essentially seeing is, let me change my color. If you look in this area here, right, that area there, you can really see it really well. In this area, uh, you see these streaks that are coming up. You can see it right there. Right, what you're seeing there is um, the uh, arterioles that are aligning that greater omentum that's feeding into the small intestines. Um, and you're seeing the inflammation of the lining of the intestines actually backing up and causing inflammation within the arterioles that are supposed to be helping to transport and remove the absorbed nutrients from the intestines. And so all of that becomes blocked up and that, that inflammation causes swelling. And so those capillaries um, essentially become blocked um, and they become blocked with inflammation, with fluid. Uh, that backs up into there from the lining of the of the small intestines, which is one reason why this is such a painful uh, disorder. What you're seeing down in this area, right here, uh, this is the colon, right there. And so that is all colon or large intestine there. Notice you don't have that combing effect of the arterioles in that area here. But here again, you can clearly see uh, these are all of the little capillaries that are um, becoming inflamed and swollen as a in response to the inflammation and the swelling that's happening within the lining of the small uh, intestines. And this is just another view of it here uh, where you're looking at um, this area, oops, you're looking at this area right here. For that combing effect of the small intestines. Um, and so this is actually looking at if, if you were laying down and you had your legs um, spread apart and you're looking into the body from that perspective. That's that's the view that you're looking at with this. Uh, and so um, I will leave you with that uh, once again to digest the material and uh, hopefully you are uh, constantly reviewing uh, 
and looking over this information and grasping it as much as you can. Um, again, those summary tables, I think, are going to be uh, your best friend for how to organize and uh, learn the material. Uh, as always, any questions, please do not hesitate. Let me know. And uh, I will see you for part four of our look at the digestive system, which is the large intestines and some additional information beyond that.